Yeah, well, having listened to all these issues, it appears that our next stopping point is the economy. And the economy is a very important aspect of our lives, the lives of individuals, that of the nation, that of Africa, of the world. So this, like, in this lecture, we take a review, we try to review Africa's natural endowment and its wealth, the question of the GDP and per capita income mismatches, corruption as a bait to development, and transparency indicators. So these are the issues that we shall be concentrating on in this lecture. So as usual, there's a bit of uh, reading to do. Yeah, much of it is about uh, the issue of corruption, but there are other issues, there are other papers and documents that you find in, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on Sakai. So to begin with, let us make the comment that implicitly or in explicitly, the economy is implied when you define culture. That is because within your culture, there is interest in production, consumption of goods and services, food, shelter, clothing, and so on and so forth. Equally, you find that the MDGs, as well as the Sustainable Development Goals, also draw attention to economic issues. Issues such as eradication of poverty and hunger, the need for people to live on more than one dollar a day, the question of uh, employment guarantees, and so on and so forth. And it is important that we should ask ourselves how well are African economies doing? How well are African countries doing as far as their economies are concerned? Now, let us agree, let us recall that although Africa is considered as a very poor uh, continent, the Africans are supposed to be living in poverty and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, when it comes to Africa's share, of global resources, especially minerals, the picture is different. For example, the statistics that we have been able to assemble based on uh, the British and US geological survey data suggest that um, about 57% of cobalt, the world's cobalt, is actually produced in Africa. Let me say that some estimates even put it as high as 90. As far as the world's diamonds are concerned, it is estimated that 53% of the diamonds of the world are produced in Africa. Some, again, some sources suggest 80%, I mean 60%. For manganese, you've got close to 40%, conservative estimates. Optimistic estimates suggest 64%. Phosphates, 31%. And in fact, other sources would say, tell you that for gold, Africa produces about 50% of the world's gold supply. For platinum, up to 90%. Tantalite, 70%. Chromium, 80%. So all this is telling you that as far as Africa is concerned, we are poor. We are not poor. We are only poor because we are said to be poor. But the reality suggests that Africa is rich. In terms of agricultural potential, there is abundance in Africa potentially. Africa is endowed with abundant land, rich vegetation, a warm climate, and soils that hold considerable potential for agricultural production. And this can come in the form of tropical foods and crops, cocoa, coffee, tea, rice and so on, timber resources, forest products, tourism, ecotourism, cultural tourism, and so on and so forth. There is a lot that Africa can boast of. But what is interesting here is that there is a curse. The revenues that come from Africa, Africa's natural resources, the forest, the minerals, and so on and so forth. We should provide the funds that we need for development. 
have not done so. He said, instead, they have fueled greed and state corruption, conflicts and disputes, environmental degradation, poverty and violence. So therefore, rather than being a blessing, Africa's natural endowment in resources is largely a curse to Africa. There is a comment which I, call, I like to read out, which says that, which is based on the World Bank report, which concludes that the discovery of oil and mineral resources does little to improve prospects for poor people, whose lot may even worsen. Resource-rich countries such as Congo Brazzaville, Gabon, and Angola continue to see increase in percentage of population living in extreme poverty. In fact, countries with considerable mineral wealth are theaters of conflict. Examples are Nigeria, Congo, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and so on and so forth. So what you see here then is a question of unequal development, and that is exhibited by statistics. A country, as we have pointed out earlier on, may have a high GDP, high per capita incomes, which are averages, yet many of its nationals live below the poverty line. Wealth distribution is therefore often skewed. Many parents cannot afford education for their children. Many people are unable to pay for health services, hospital treatment, national health insurance benefits, and so on and so forth. And you find people begging openly for their daily bread on the streets. And many are unemployed, which is a shame. If you take Ghana, for example, while the per capita GDP for a Ghanaian is $3,500 per annum, that is based on 2013 estimates, few Ghanaians earn that. And while many live on less than $3 a day, or if you were to work this out for a year, $1,131 per year. Nevertheless, reports show that an official, a former director, a former boss of the Shiraj, spends something like $4,500 per month on, on accommodation, on rent. And that, of course, amounts to something like $54,000 per year on rent alone. You take a country like Nigeria, as the map indicates, you can see clearly that the resources are not equally distributed geographically. Some parts of Nigeria are doing well, some parts are doing poorly. Take the case of Nigeria, which tells you a story about corruption. The report that I have here reads, and I quote, Equatorial Guinea is the third largest, the third uh, biggest oil producer in sub-Saharan Africa. In terms of per capita national income, it is on paper one of the world's richest countries. But most of the population lives little more than a dollar a day. Average life expectancy barely reaches 55 years. And while all this is happening, President Obiang, who has been in power for the past 33 years, builds a new capital at Oyala in a remote region in his country. At the same time, his son, Theodorin, has a six-story Paris mansion, 12 luxury cars, a home in Malibu, a private jet, and $20 million of Michael Jackson memorabilia. He diverts tens and thousands ten, uh, of uh, uh, tens of millions of dollars of state revenue into personal accounts. And that is the story we have about the resource case in Africa. So it is a case of poverty in the midst of wealth. And there are many reasons for this mismanagement of the economy by governments, policies that don't favor income redistribution, high levels of unemployment, many people unemployed and therefore not earning reasonable incomes. All of these things are factors. 
And there are reasons for the poverty, certainly. The problem is also at the labor front. Workers pretend to work and governments pretend to pay. Lack of incentives for private and public production. Government priorities are misplaced. Unreasonable consumption habits. Craving for foreign luxury goods rather than local ones. Tax regimes that are inadequate and ineffective. Governments not able to collect taxes for their programs. The rich and the powerful extorting from the poor. And heavy corruption, both state and private distortions of wealth. So the issue of corruption is one that engages attention here. Anti-corruption campaigners argue that corruption not only impoverishes, it kills. It is said that an estimated $11 trillion a year is being taken out of poor countries and millions of lives are lost because of corruption. So 3.6 million deaths yearly are blamed on corruption. And the error reference is there for you to look at on the net. So with corruption, the NDGs could not have been met. The discourse and development needs to address corruption, therefore. Many reasons account for the failure to meet the NDGs. Governments certainly are, they cannot escape the blame since they should create them and conducive environments for the attainment of the MDGs and so on. But citizens also share the blame for the failures. Corruption can be cited as a reason for not attaining the MDGs, especially where it is preventive and the country is in the grip, uh, is pervasive and the country is in the grip of a culture of corruption. Corruption is an everyday issue. We see it it is important because of its remote and as well as immediate effects on the country, communities, and so on and so forth. There is therefore talk of corruption every day, everywhere, on radio, on TV, newspapers, in the churches, private conversations, and so on and so forth. And it's not surprising that the High Commissioner, the British High Commissioner, uh -huh, makes the argument about it and talks about it. There is often the talk of hand go, hand come, the greasing of her palms, seeing people in power, calabuli, judgment debts, cause of financial loss to the state, and as a rimayao and the judges, and so on and so forth. Corruption is indeed a concern in most African countries. One view is that, in a sense, we are all guilty of corruption. It has even become a way of life for most Ghanaians, from top government officials, politicians, down to the lowest ranking civil servants. So it is a gov it, I mean, most corruption by a top government officer is perpetuated with the collaboration of a junior cashier who raises the bogus PV, receives a paltry amount from the loot, oblivious of the effect of all this. And the point that we take from all this is that there are no bystanders as far as corruption is concerned. Why corruption? What is corruption? In a sense, it is malfeasance, an act lacking in transparency, a moral wrong, a crime against the state, society, and the individual. And let us not deceive ourselves into thinking that it is something that has no, has, uh, no local uh, bearing. It has, because we do know that there are local terms that exist that refer to corruption. So for example, among Akan people, there is a term for it, uh, pro year for example, implying that things have gone bad. There's a term that literally can be translated as putting something under the mat, or cheating, or theft. Amongst the others, the same also can be said. There are terms uh, that refer to it. That suggests that something is being done, is being given or being received under the cover of darkness. These involved, those involved, do not often wish to be found out. And that is the nature of corruption. 
Now, there are many illustrations of this. If you travel along the Ghanaian roads, you see a lot of corruption. And it has been said that loss of money is being lost to the state, even at the checkpoints. State institutions have often been implicated in all this. In Ghana, for example, we know, all know about the Savannah, the Savannah Accelerated Development Authority, which has been implicated in corruption. There is the GIDA, there is the National Service Secretariat, judges who have been caught in camera taking bribes, Chirai Commissioner spending lots of money on her own comfort, the Football Association, the DVLA, and so on and so forth. You name it. Corruption itself has, it takes on several faces. The demanding and giving and taking of bribes is one. The pursuit of personal gain, violation of laid down procedures for the disbursement of public resources, awarding contracts to the wrong people, destruction of public assets to hide economic crimes, nepotism and cronyism, large brotherhoods and so on, embezzlement, misappropriation of public resources, profiteering, what used to be called cannibalism, okay. custom and trade malpractices, selling of wholesome goods, poisonous palm oil, journalists demanding uh, solely for, for coverage, for news coverage, non-payment of taxes and duties, causing financial loss to the state through negligence, incurring judgment debts, electoral malpractice, rigging and multiple voting, sundry abuses, even exam malpractices, forgery, internet fraud, lateness to work, malignment, malingering, yeah. putting in a, not putting in a day's uh, fair, uh, labor while demanding salaries. All of these are faces of corruption. Corruption has so many faces. What are the possible outcomes of corruption? Serious corruption in a nation leads, among other things, to a distortion and misallocation of resources. It also accounts for inefficiencies, putting square pegs in round holes. A sense of helplessness. People don't even see themselves to matter at all because they're helpless. A loss of human dignity, a feeling of marginalization, the entrenchment of poverty, Poor people become even poorer still. Also capital flight. Investors find the cost of doing business too high and will therefore take their business elsewhere. How can the MDGs be, not be affected by all this? Now, we can also see what is happening in other countries when we consider what has been published in reference to the transparency indicators. You find that for many African countries, the indicators are very poor. So for example, if, if, you take, if you run countries in terms of how well they are doing the world, you find that African countries are usually at the bottom. For example, in the year 2012, Cameroon ranked 144th, almost at the bottom. Nigeria didn't do any better, 139. Ghana, well, didn't considerably compared to other African countries, it may, not have been, it may not have been doing badly at all. But it's certainly not doing as well as countries like Botswana. And Botswana consistently has performed over the years, has performed very well. Yeah, in terms of ranking, sometimes 30th in the world, 31st in the world, 37th, 36th, and so on and so forth. Yeah, certainly some countries in Africa have, have done not too badly. But the end, I mean, the, the final comment will be that most African countries have done very poorly as far as corruption is concerned. And this map gives us an idea about what is happening in the world. And you can see where corruption is hegemonic from this map. Now, there is what we call a culture of corruption. When corruption is endemic, a culture of corruption comes into a being. And it means that corruption now has become institutionalized. And if it is institutionalized, it means people have no choice but to engage in it. Corruption becomes so pervasive then that it is regarded as the norm. So therefore, for example, if you were to meet a policeman stopping you at a barrier, you don't need to say anything. You just need that you know that you have to do something. 
a policeman doesn't need to tell you anything. So those who do not wish to engage in it, you'll find in this case, are often ridiculed. People laugh at them. In some countries, nothing at all can be done without corrupting somebody. There may even be the popular justification for it. In Ghana, for example, it has been said that everybody eats in his or her workplace. How can that be? But does it mean that culture is the root of corruption? So we may have to make a distinction. When we say that there's a culture of corruption, doesn't necessarily mean that culture is a source of the corruption. I think it is wrong to blame African culture for corruption. African cultures, of course, have been blamed for corruption. But is there justification for it? Historically, if you go back to pre-colonial times, the state domain in Africa was limited in scope. The king group, the clan, held sway. Therefore, in those kinds of contexts, corruption was minimal. It didn't exist. And if it exists, that also was very minimal. With colonization, the concept of a bank human, government's property, government's work, and so on and so forth, has come into a fall. As a colonial state was perceived to be alien and illegitimate in people's eyes, the abuses of public property was not viewed as a crime or a moral wrong. Unfortunately, the concept of public property as not your father's property has come to stay in Africa, in spite of the fact that Africans are now governing themselves, they are no longer living in a colonial regime. In a country like Kenya, there is what I call a, a, a league table of corruption. In Kenya, the police force tops, followed by state corporations, followed by local authorities, teachers service commission, the prison service, the judiciary, provisional administration, the minister of lands, and so on and so forth. And I ask myself, do we have similar, uh, t can we construct a similar table of corruption in this country? I leave that to your, your, your decision, your, your guess. But we do know that from what I have been able to discover from the net, we can work out a similar table of corruption for a country like Cameroon. There, of course, the corruption is mostly again with the police. Next to the police are the political parties, and of course the military and several others. So that ends this discussion here.